moment, I'm going to be talking about immutability. But firstly, thank you to Martin for all of that, and thank you for uh, reiterating that a conference should be a safe space, a respectful place, a place where everyone can come. So I want you to look around at your fellow audience today and think about whether we are representing everyone and dream about what, in five years' time, the audience might look like and what your team might look like. And then plan for that in months, and on Monday when you get into the office, start shipping diversity. I'm talking about things that can't change, but this can change, and it's down to us to change it. OK? Enough said. Right, now, uh, yeah, hopefully we'll have something. All right, right, uh, I don't have PowerPoint today because I couldn't be bothered to keep switching between Visual Studio and PowerPoint all the time, so my slides are in the form of little text files. Um, so before we get cracking at all, sometimes I talk to audiences that are of many different sort of backgrounds in terms of what code they write, and sometimes I'm talking to almost entirely C-sharp devs. And this changes how I'll phrase things and what you're expecting to get out of this. So out of interest, how many of you are or have been C-sharp developers, so you know, know what C-sharp looks like? OK, that looks like most people. Um, how many are still writing C-sharp, so want to know more about what they will be able to do and what's coming up? OK, still most of you. Good. Right, in that case, I'll be a little bit more C-sharp heavy than I would have been otherwise. Um, and out of interest, how many of you are functional programmers? So probably can tell me afterwards what I've said that's wrong. Very few. That's good. I don't need to avoid many people. <laughs> in all seriousness, do tell me what I've done wrong. So this is what we're going to talk about today. Um, and just to reinforce that this is entirely real, uh, I work in a very small team at Google, and we're trying to make the Google Cloud Platform awesome for C-sharp developers. And as part of that, I'm writing the client libraries to access Google Cloud Platform services, so you know, PubSub, Datastore, that kind of thing. And we're looking at code generation and all kinds of stuff that feels tedious at the time, but you need in order to get stuff done. And we have some settings, you know, settings how often we'll retry an RPC, that kind of thing. And just this week, we've been going from, yeah, we made all of these mutable because it's basically easier to use them when they're mutable, to we really, really want to make these immutable because it's so much easier to reason about them afterwards. So this is something that I am facing on a daily basis. Um, it was pure coincidence that this week happens to be um, full-on immutability is kind of painful but worth it, but there we go. Um, and in terms of the dream in years, I have the sort of reverse thought of I have nightmares about what the code is going to be like in five years' time. I panic about what the code's going to be like in a month's time, and I still need to ship it tomorrow. Um, and that's the sort of balance that you need to be thinking about with immutability in terms of is it worth making something more maintainable but slightly harder to use, if you see what I mean, easier to use well, hard to use badly, but a bit harder to use at all than something that's easy to use well or badly. Which is very similar to node time versus system.date time, which I promise I'll try not to go into too much. So, what are the benefits of immutability? I've already sort of given the hint that I rather like immutable things. Um, we'll talk a little bit later about memory models and how C Sharp doesn't really have a very well specified one. Uh, but there's a general understanding of immutable types are thread safe. Uh, so you can use stuff from multiple threads, and it's all safe because if no one can change it, then you can't have two things changing it at the same time. So that's all good. But by the time you're into multi-threading, you're into a bit of a world of pain anyway, um, even in mutable types, uh, immutable types, rather. Um, but there are far more things for immutability than just threading. And it's, for me, it's about the less you can do with something, the less can go wrong with something. 
So it's easier to reason about immutable types because you know, you're given something and you know it's immutable. Right, that's fine. I can just do what I like with it. I can't mess anyone else up, and no one can mess me up. And that's really the, uh, the crux of the benefits of immutability. Everything else sort of flows from there. But I did skip the second point about what immutability is to start with. I've kind of assumed, because you're a smart bunch of people, um, I've assumed you have some idea about immutability, stuff that can't change. But let's look, because it's not really uh, just an, an on-off toggle. It isn't Boolean. Something isn't mutable or immutable. As uh, my friend Eric Lippert likes to say, what is this thing you call thread safe? Or what is this thing you call secure? Or in this case, what is this thing you call immutable? Um, there was a Stack Overflow question just a couple of days saying, how can I securely pass a string from one class to another in Java? It's like, what do you mean by securely? With, without any more detail, it's a meaningless term. So let's look, about, look at some kinds of points on the spectrum of immutability. So the first one is a definitely mutable type. So this is firmly at the mutable end of the spectrum. You can see that because you, know, you create one, you mutate it, you mutate it again. The next kind of mutability, and I'm not going to say that this is all that there is, um, but uh, this is just points I've got on the spectrum, is things that look immutable because we have read-only properties. Um, for those of you who aren't used to C Sharp 6, um, these are automatically implemented properties that are read-only, so you can only set them in a constructor. And so you know we've got read-only properties, so it's immutable, right? Well, not really. Um, yes, I can't change an instance of shallow immutable to refer to a different string builder, but I can still mutate the string builder. So the benefits of immutability in terms of knowing that no one else can change the state that I can see, that's gone away. Yeah. I create my shallow immutable, and maybe the constructor can validate that uh, the string builder it's been passed is empty. And that validation is completely worthless, because on the next line, I can append to the string builder. And I don't even need to still have a copy of it locally. I can just do it via the property as well. So this is clearly not properly immutable in any useful way. And in some ways, this is worse than the mutable case, because at a glance, you can't tell that it's not immutable. So it's fine with String Builder. Everyone knows that String Builder is mutable, right? What if that were retry settings? I don't know whether a retry settings is immutable or not, unless I go and look at retry settings. And maybe retry settings has a timing settings within it. And these are not sort of entirely made up types. These are the ones I've been dealing with this week. And it was only when I went down four levels that I found something that was mutable that I had assumed was immutable. And so ah, I've, you know, my whole tip of tree down four levels of mostly immutable stuff, or what I thought was immutable, gets messed up. Next, to borrow Eric Lippert's term again, is popsicle immutability. It's mutable until you freeze it. So I don't know whether they have popsicles in Sweden, uh, but things that you can buy that are basically liquid, and then you stick them in the freezer, and then you effectively have a, a, an ice lolly afterwards. So yes, you can't change it once it's been in the freezer, but until you put it in the freezer, you can change it. Um, this has various benefits. However, it's you know, so you can uh, mutate it here. If you try to mutate it later on, it goes bang. Um, I used to be quite fond of this. There are some benefits in it. Uh, in particular, you can end up with something that's quite efficient because you can mutate stuff in place and then just say, right, that's now frozen, and you don't need to make another copy in order to um, make it immutable. 
However, the fact that this bottom line is even permitted to compile is a problem. Because if any time there's an exception that is entirely predictable, that suggests that my type system isn't stopping me from messing up. And I want my type system to catch as many problems as I can. Apologies to those who are big fans of dynamically typed languages. I'm a massive statically typed fan. Um, the more I can get the compiler to stop me from being stupid, the better. Um, it doesn't mean I don't need tests. It just means I need slightly fewer of them. So th there are problems here. And the other problem is, what about if I have a method that accepts a popsicle? It needs to know whether or not something's frozen. And it could be that I've got another thread that checks. You know, my method may say, right, I'm going to mutate something. I will check that it's not frozen. Then I will mutate it. What if something freezes it after I've done the check and before I do the mutation? Bang. What if something else says, I'd better check. I, I will accept a popsicle, but it has to be a frozen popsicle. Well, it could be frozen. Um, and in theory, I shouldn't see any changes after it's been frozen, unless the memory model's messing you around. And someone has made a change, and it hadn't noticed that it was frozen properly. Doing this entirely properly and then using it properly is difficult. But we are getting gradually closer to mutability. Sorry, immutability. Right. This is an interesting one. Uh, let me see how much of this I can get on the screen. Mm. Uh, it's kind of useful if you can see the whole thing. Uh, full screen. Right. That's better. OK. Hands up if you think this is immutable. OK. Any Java programmers? None of the two Java programmers in the room. Wow. Uh, oh, there are a few more. OK. Is Java Lang string immutable? You, you're nervous now, but if I'd asked you before showing you this, what would you have said? Everyone knows that string is immutable, right? Well, it's as immutable as this because it does exactly this. It has some data that will never change. That's great. And it has some cache data that can change. And in this case, I would actually say this is immutable. Um, because as far as anything from the outside is concerned, it's immutable. If there are memory issues, I might end up having to call get hash code twice. But because it's an int, um, I don't need to worry about teared memory rights and things. Um, so I will never get the wrong answer from this. There's nothing I can do to it, no way that I can use it from multiple threads, which will mean that get hash, co uh, get hash code um, returns different answers when I call it twice, even from different threads, regardless of whether they both call get hash code under you know, name dot get hash code, whether neither of them do because they've got the cached hash code, or whatever. But it's not obviously right, is it? I mean, it's, it's clearly not obviously right, because none of you thought it was immutable. Here's another example. If I hadn't put the uh, name of the class with unsealed semi-immutable, <laughs> uh, if I'd asked, I suspect many of you would have said, that's an immutable class. And it sort of is. But it doesn't have the nice property of an immutable type that when I receive a value, if I have a, a constructor or a method with a parameter of type unsealed semi-immutable, if I keep a reference to that type, then uh, there's no guarantee that the value won't change. Sure, the, the value property itself won't change, but the object can change underneath, which means if there are equality operations, I may be messed up. You know, I, I can't cache this as the canonical example of an unsealed semi-immutable with value of 5, because it might be a derived mutable that has one particular other value and then gets changed later on. 
and we can see this. Okay. We're, we're calling an example of unsealed immutable constructor, passing in naughty, um, and then mutating it afterwards. And maybe this is safe if, if, if example of unsealed immutable never uses any aspect of the derived class, but it's a little bit dodgy. Here's a modified version of that, which is one of those, it's safe, but you need to work to make sure that it's safe. And this is, this is generally a lovely pattern, by the way. Um, it's a pattern that I like to think of as like smart enums, or to put it another way, faking Java enums in C Sharp, because enums are the one thing that Java has a nicer model than C Sharp, in some ways. You know, C Sharp enums being basically named numbers definitely have their uses. They can be very nice. Um, they can confuse the heck out of people when people assume that any value of that type will be one of those five named values. And no, it could be any integer, really. Um, whereas here we have an example where you can't create an instance of unsealed private constructor, but you can get at three example instances. And as far as you're aware, they are examples of unsealed private constructor from the outside. Um, they're actually instances of two different derived classes. How can they be derived classes when there's only a private constructor? Because the subclasses are nested. And the C Sharp accessibility rules allow you to access private members of an enclosing type, or, well, you can access a private member of a type anywhere in the program text of that type, which includes types that are declared nested within them. Um, very nice pattern. You know, imagine you had arithmetic operation, you know, plus, minus, divide, multiply, um, that would use four different classes, but those are the only things. And all of these are immutable. Um, and you can be sure that no one else is going to derive from unsealed private constructor because they can't. They can't call the constructor. Um, there's a kind of bug in C Sharp 5 where you can write a derived class which has two constructors that bounce between the two of them and never end up trying to call the private base class constructor. Um, but A, that's been fixed in C Sharp 6, and B, you could never use it sensibly anyway. Uh, there is a sort of bizarre way that you can use it by retaining the value in the finalizer, and uh, just don't go there. Uh, this is, to all intents and purposes, safe. If you want to know about that, I'm doing a talk in Warsaw next week about abusing C Sharp, and I'll probably use that as an example. So you know, hopefully it'll, there'll be a video of it, or come to Warsaw. Um, so that doesn't immediately look immutable because it's not sealed. You would need to document that it is genuinely immutable because all possible subclasses are immutable. Um, but it's a, it's a nice pattern to know about. And finally, at the nice end of the spectrum, we have a class that only has immutable, it only has read-only properties, and every property is of an immutable type. Bingo. So that's one set of spectrum of things. Note that these are all classes. Classes are rather easier to read, reason about than structs. Um, I'm not going to go into many details about uh, how structs work or don't work with immutability. Um, I may have one example, and if I haven't, I can whip it up in a minute. Um, but there's a spectrum. Anyone have any other suggestions for things that could be on that spectrum? Or if you don't want to shout it out, come and talk to me later on. These aren't the only possible things. But this is all about what you can do with types after you've constructed them. Let's have a look. As I skipped this slide earlier on, oh, I think I've mentioned most of this. Um, it's, all, it's all about what you can rely on what you can know about within your code when you're using an immutable type. Um, and for the few Java programmers, you know, Java util date 
is one of the, in, in some ways it's a gift that keeps on giving to speakers because it is one of the worst APIs I've ever seen. Um, Java Util Dating Calendar. Um, never trust a language designer to design a date and time API because they like having as few concepts as possible and that really doesn't work for date and time. Um, so Java Util Calendar and Java Util Date, both mutable, whereas system.dateTime, for all its other many faults, is at least an immutable struct. Um, ignoring the problems with structs. So we've talked about thread safety a little. Um, if you're dealing with mutable types, you are probably used to writing clone methods um, and maybe having your own iDeep clonable or something to distinguish it from iClonable that's generally considered not a good idea because it's not clear to what extent it clones. But the idea of making a load of defensive copies of things, particularly if you end up passing things down from one layer to another, and every layer takes a new clone, and nothing ever changes it. So you've got these 15 copies of an object, and they are all the same. It's just that no one could quite trust that they were going to be the same. Um, and just a, a note here on different code bases. Uh, we were talking last night at the speaker dinner a bit about you know, how much things matter, making things public or internal. And we discussed how it changes depending on how the code is used. If you are writing an open source piece of code, you have no idea how it's going to be used. It's one of the frustrations of open source that it's very hard to get feedback on how well or badly things work. Because you know, yes, people will complain if things actually don't work. People may occasionally praise you if things work beautifully. You know, the tweets I relish most are the ones that say, I just converted my code base to use node time, and it just worked, and oh, it's so much easier to read. Great. That doesn't happen very often, though, however nice your library is. What you don't see is people struggling but kind of getting there in the end or having a generally pleasant experience. And in particular, you can't know what you can change later on uh, because you can't see all the code that's using it. Within a large organization, you may well be able to see all the code that exists. And so you could actually say, this is a mutable type. Please don't mutate it. OK? That's somewhat reasonable. And later on, if you want to make it immutable and maybe prevent anyone from mutating it, you can find all the code and you may be able to fix it up. Depends on the company, depends on all kinds of things, but it's feasible. Within code that's only used by your own team or a small tool that only uses this type itself, then hey, go nuts. You know, you know that it's never going to be mutated. Make it as easy to use as you like. I haven't actually talked about the benefits of mutability, and they are basically it's easier to use. <laughs> okay, we'll see why in a minute. But it's it's easier to just get going and use. It's harder to use in a wide context where you don't know what else is going on. But in a small context where you have complete visibility, mutability is great. You know, it, it reads, I can see exactly what's happening. It's as soon as you need to think beyond the scope of the small bit of code that you're looking at that mutability sucks. Yeah, remind me if I have time, I will go back and show you mutable structs behaving weirdly. Let's have a little look at what C Sharp has provided in terms of immutability over the years. So the first thing it has, which I haven't even mentioned on here, um, is it has properties as well as fields. And this is a great thing, because it means that you can write code that feels as easy to use as using fields um, without having to write get and set all over the place, um, you know, foo.getbar, etc. cetera. Um, so it feels much nicer without having to expose the fields. Don't expose fields, please, in almost all cases. Um, in the rare cases where it's good to write a mutable value type, do expose the fields and don't expose them as properties. Um, if I have time to come back to uh, value types, I will discuss that later on. 
Um, but it had value types to start with. It had Im an immutable string type and string builder. This is all familiar from the Java world. Um, classes are unsealed by default, which has been a tabs versus spaces style religious war over the years. Um, I'm not sure I've ever actually convinced anyone that being sealed by default would be a good thing, and certainly no one's convinced me that being unsealed by default is a good thing. Um, you know, chances are, if you've got your mind made up, you're not going to change it. Um, but back in the days of C Sharp 1, which makes me feel quite old, how many of you actually used C Sharp before C Sharp 2? Oh, a small number. Um, yeah, you couldn't write a public getter and a private setter. It didn't exist. And it was a really strange omission. I think they must have written that bit of the spec and put a little sticky note saying, fix me, we really need to do something about that. And the, fix of the uh, little sticky note just fell off, uh, fell onto the floor, and no one noticed until after it had shipped. Because um, it's clearly something you want to be able to do, right? So that was the one extra feature towards immutability that we got in C Sharp 2. Do you know, it strikes me that um, I'm going to add an example now, which is slightly annoying because I've labeled things 21 to 27. Um, let's call it not quite. And let's. <laughs> We'll seal it. In fact, I, I'll rename it later on to lazy, lazily immutable. And I don't mean lazy as in like lazy of T, which is deferred execution. I mean the developer was too lazy to do it properly. Um, Don't need the this stop. Right. How many of you have written code like this? Yeah, me too. <laughs> How many of you felt a little wary when you did it? Good. Uh, let me make you feel more ugh for next time you do it. And maybe you'd say, you know, this is immutable. <laughs> really. I promise that no maintenance programmer ever will add a method that calls the setter because they will all read this comment. Public void fix bug value equals 20. I didn't bother reading the comment. This should be fine. OK. <laughs> and it's, it's not even the fear of this that really scares me, although it does. It's that oh, it's just not immutable, OK? <laughs> At the CLR level, this is not immutable. It knows that the field, you know, we've got a private int value field here, except it's got compiler junk to make the, uh, the field name unspeakable. Um, and you want this to be read-only. But because we're too lazy, we don't declare it and write a getter-only property to return it. We just kind of trust ourselves later on. Um, so you could do this in C Sharp 2. Um, sorry, no, in, in C Sharp 2, we didn't even have this. We had this in C Sharp 3. No, I'm wrong. It was in C Sharp 2. So, yeah, <laughs> sorry. C Sharp 2 allowed you to have different accessibility for getters and setters and also gave you um, automatically implemented properties. It just didn't allow you to have automatically implemented read only properties. Um, I think, do you know, I'm going to have to check this later on. It's the kind of thing I should know, it feels. Um, and no one else will care. What's the difference between C Sharp 2 and C Sharp 3? I don't care, it's 2016. Um, <laughs> but I do. Um, right, in C Sharp 3, we sort of had a, a mixture of good things and bad things. So we get 
anonymous types. And in C-sharp, anonymous types are always shallow immutable. OK, they always have read-only properties. And hey, they provide equality and get hash code as well as to string. And this is all goodness, unless you use an anonymous type with a string builder as one of its properties. I can't ever remember doing that, but you certainly could. You need to be aware that it's shallow immutable. In VB, they're mutable by default, and you have to put key by each property that you want to be read-only. And only the key properties are used in equality. So if you're ever a C Sharp dev who has to fix a bug in some VB code, and you think, I'll use an anonymous type, please remember to use key everywhere if you want it to look like the C Sharp equivalent. So anonymous types kind of like immutability. They don't enforce proper immutability, but it's, it's better than nothing. Um, and we have link which is the biggest introduction to sort of functional programming on a global scale that the world has ever seen, I suspect. You know, there are far more C-sharp developers who have thought, do you know what, this data pipelining thing where I don't modify the existing collection, but I have a transformation step at each stage, that's kind of neat. There are far more developers doing that than have used F-sharp. This is where I admit I'm not an F-sharp developer. My name is on an F-sharp book, but I mostly spent my time correcting the English and saying, no, C-sharp's not that bad. You can do it better like this, um, and trying to learn a bit of F-sharp as we went along. Uh, never put me in front of a screen and expect me to write F-sharp. One day I may learn it, but I'm a big fan of the ideas, and that's what matters, surely. Um, so yeah, Link encouraged us to value some of the things that immutability encourages doesn't enforce anything. You can write link operations that mutate the collections they operate over. Please don't. You know, foo.select, I'll just set some things in here, and then either use uh, it's the awfulness that people do. Uh, so I've got a scratch pad somewhere. Yeah. Uh, so. What's a nice mutable type? Uh, oh, we'll just use string builders. Um, and let's give ourselves two of them. And then people do horrible things like uh, list.select um, sb to sb.append foo. And then they try that, and it doesn't do anything. So they say, all right, I better convert it. I better call to list at the end, just to make sure that it iterates over all of that. It's like, no, don't do that. Um, or worse, they may say, ah, it's all right, I'll use count, because that iterates over everything, except it won't if it's actually a list of string builder, because that implements iList, so it'll just take the count property. <laughs> yeah, just this side effecting bit, just say no. OK, I'm conscious time is running away, as it always does. Um, so back to language evolution. So then we had uh, object and collection initializers, which I've just shown you um, a collection initializer. Um, and they would be lovely if they would work with immutable types, but they don't. So it's quite hard to initialize an immutable collection. Um, and I don't know whether things have been fixed. Have any of you used the uh, immutable collections sort of BCL add-on? OK, the fact that only a few of us have is sort of damning in itself, not necessarily of the quality of that code, but the fact that we haven't embraced it as a community yet. But last time I looked, which was several years ago, um, they had a builder, but it didn't have I think it didn't implement I enumerable, so you couldn't use it for collection initializers. It's like, the one thing that C-sharp has given to make this easier to use, and you've got a builder, so, so oh, we're missing the one thing that pulls them together. Um, in C-sharp, no. I was going to say C-sharp 6 would let us fix that with extension methods, but I'm not sure that it could. Um, but anyway, we're encouraged to create objects and then mutate them with object initializers and collection initializers makes mutable programming easier 
whilst doing nothing for immutable programming. And we all know that if you make something easier, more people will do it. Okay, that's part of the problem. Um, you know, people will understandably go for the easiest option, even if it's not in long-term interests. So we end up with lots of mutable types. C-sharp 4 gave us optional parameters and named arguments. This is very useful uh, because it means that I can write a type that has a constructor with 15 different parameters, some of which are required and some of which are optional, and it's now easy to call it just with the bits that I want to specify. There are problems in terms of evolving that type, and again, we've been discussing this at work because we know that the the class libraries that we hope to go to you know, want that scary 1.0, and there's no number in the world that scares me at the m moment more than 1.0. Um, if we've got a constructor, and suppose we make everything optional, that means if we now add another constructor where everything's optional and has one extra property, that's no longer backward compatible because overload resolution will fail because there's nothing to tie break between them. It sucks. Um, but it does make, if you're confident that you're not going to need to add something later on, um, it's really helpful. In C Sharp 5, we had nothing. I, C Sharp 5 is a great new version, don't get me wrong. Async is awesome. Um, and the, the other tiny, tiny features are kind of cool too. But nothing for immutability. C Sharp 6, hooray! has read-only automatically implemented properties, as I showed you earlier on. Just put the getter there, and it generates a genuinely read-only field in the background. And you set it in the constructor, and that just calls the set. Um, it just sets the field directly. Uh, it has default values for automatically implemented properties, so you can, if you want to do a shallow immutable thing, you can do a public list of string friends get equals new list of string. And now you have something that's shallowly immutable and is already initialized. Yayness, you don't need to write a constructor and put the initialization in the constructor. On the other hand, it's still um, only shallowly immutable. Uh, and finally, the psychological feeling um, of expression body members. Does everyone know what expression body members are? The things that look like lambda expressions, but they're really not lambda expressions. So where you write a property uh, with equals greater than um, or a method. And in C sharp 7, we're getting expression bodied everything. You can do constructors and finalizers and static initializers and all kinds of stuff. Um, and basically, that gives you the feeling of being an F sharp programmer without having to learn F sharp. It's great. Um, it's like, this is almost like Haskell. Um, <laughs> and I'm only slightly joking. It does give you the feeling, you know, if, if you've got a method that is only a, computes a single expression, there is something that's nicely functional about that. Um, and I think it's good to encourage without bending your code out of shape. Um, but the, the psychological um, feeling I got, at least, maybe I'm alone in this, but it, it's lovely. Um, Right, I have 20 minutes. OK, let's give you some examples of different ways that we can implement immutability. So we'll assume by now that you've decided, for whatever reason, that in your code base, you have a reasonably complex type, and you want to make it immutable. Our data model is having a person with a name, which is just a string, an address, several phone numbers, and I originally thought we could have friends, but I didn't bother implementing that, um, partly because that ends up being really difficult. One of the problems uh, in immutability is if you want to have one object referring to another, and that object needs to refer to the first one, and neither of them can change after they've been constructed, then how do you pass them to each other how can they both come into existence simultaneously, immediately? Um, and that's what let rec is for in F sharp. That's the one bit of F sharp that I do know. Um, but it makes it all kind of tricky. And it means that while you're doing something recursively, you, know, you pass this 
in your constructor to another constructor, which is already sort of this is crazy style because it's letting this escape during a constructor, which means something is observing you while you're still not fully clothed, as it were. Um, it's letting someone into the changing room, and uh, if they happen to do something nasty at the same time, that's not good. If they observe stuff, they can see you changing. Um, so you should only do it with code that you trust to not observe the state that's not going to change after you've finished. OK, so uh, we've got some examples of how we can do that. Let's look to start with at the builder pattern. So all of this is on uh, GitHub, by the way, under jskeet slash demo code, uh, that repository, and find your way to immutability. Uh, so we have what looks like a nice uh, immutable type. It has name, which is a string that's immutable. Address is also immutable, we'll see in a minute. And an immutable list of phone number. This is using the uh, system collections immutable package that I mentioned earlier. So how do you go about constructing one of these things? Well, you can't call a constructor because we don't give you a constructor. Instead, we give you a public class, which is a builder, and that is mutable. So you make mutations to your heart's content to the builder, and then when you, uh, when you call build, it creates a new person, and that copies the mutable list to an immutable one. Um, now, this is using two immutable lists in phones. Uh, Sorry, because we have a list of phone number. Now, I mentioned that phone number is immutable as well. So it has a number and a type. And I know number being a string sort of feels broken, but really phone numbers aren't numbers in useful ways. They're sort of formatted strings. Um, topic for a whole different day. So how do you use this kind of thing? You need to do something like this. And in fact, I haven't even shown creating a phone number. So phones equals, and then we'll call new phone number dot builder type equals phone number type dot home number equals you know one, two, three, four. And then we need to call dot build on that. And let's have a mobile number. I'm very careful not to give away my private information. One, two, three, four, and five, six, seven, eight are not my actual phone numbers. Um, but wouldn't it be cool if they were? It'd be really easy to remember. Um, so, what's to dislike about this? Everything. <laughs> it's just, this is not how you want initialization to look, right? Um, Suppose I wanted a new version of me, as it were, that had an extra phone number. Well, I'd need to create a new builder and copy everything and copy the phones to a new mutable list and add a new one of those. And oh, it's also painful. And you can make these slightly better by allowing, uh, by having a to builder method that creates a new builder that's a copy of things. Um, but it's all just a bit painful. I don't want to see all of the builder stuff in my code. It's cruft that we can do without, or we'd like to be able to do without. Let's have another look at a second builder pattern um, where this uses our lazily immutable um, idea and popsicle immutability. And this time, it's not lazy because I couldn't be bothered to do something. It's lazy because it's designed to work this way. So we still have the same basic um, interface in terms of having a builder. And you've got to call setters on the builder instead, and then you call build. But this one's more efficient than the previous one because when you're building something, you are literally building up the immutable, the going to be immutable object. It's just that nothing can see it yet, so it doesn't matter that it's mutable. 
so long as the memory model works out. Um, so we have this uh, a freezable list, and we expose the list of phone numbers as an iRead-only list, and it genuinely, by the time you get to see it, it will be read-only. And if you try to cast it to iList, then, hey, maybe that'll work, and you could call add, and it will throw an exception, which is fine. That's as good as throwing, uh, throwing an exception when you cast it to iList of t. Um, so this is slightly more efficient, but if we look at the program, yeah, it kind of looks the same as it did before. It's unappealing. A third kind of builder, which is uh, a definitely not recommended one, is where the builder itself is the person type. So this is a sort of inside-out version, where you have person, and you can mutate that to your heart's content, but you can take an immutable sort of snapshot of it any time you like. I would challenge you that if you do this, and you know, this works, but what type do you think people are going to keep using in their code? Everyone will use person. No one will use person.immutable. There is no point in having it at all. You might as well just give up on immutability. It's what we tend to see. OK, another pattern that's uh, a non-builder pattern now is withers. Withers are just lots of methods starting with with. It, does, it makes more sense when you see it, honestly. So this time we have a person, type, a constructor, a public constructor. You can pass in the name, you can pass in the phone number, you can pass in the immutable list of phone numbers. Sorry, the name, address, and immutable list of phone numbers. And if you want to change it, because you know, this might be a bit of a pain if you have, going back to the builder pattern, suppose you're doing part of the work in one method, and, and you end up with the name and address, but you haven't got the phone numbers yet, and you get the phone numbers in another method, that's fine, because you can construct a builder and pass the builder from one method to another, so populate the name and address, populate the phone numbers, call build, you're done. The fact that we've got just a constructor here means you've got to do it all in one go. So what do you do if you don't have the phone numbers yet? Well, with this pattern, you pass in the name and the address. You don't pass in phone numbers, so null if that's valid, or ideally an empty immutable list, and maybe if you pass in null, it converts it into an empty immutable list. Great. But then you call with phones on it. And importantly, it's called with phones because if I write code, good, I have an example here. So you know, here I create person, and this time I don't know the address yet. And then later I just call john.withaddress. This code looks correct. Yeah? It, it reads OK. What doesn't read OK is John dot with address, new address. I'll just copy. Sorry. I would claim that is obviously wrong just by reading it. And just to contrast, wow, I don't have system. That is not obviously wrong. Not if you don't know about date time being immutable. Add is an imperative thing that sounds like it's doing something to an object. So it looks fine. You know, I, if I use list.add, that's fine. So why shouldn't this be fine? This should have been called plus. That's obviously wrong. Immutable types, naming methods in immutable types is important because you need to make sure that um, everyone knows what's, what's, um, that they need to use the return value. Another example, uh, foo bad.replace 
O with R, A. Doesn't look wrong. Looks wrong. Looks right. Um, and after replacing is a name I have just come up with because I probably wasn't going to talk about the naming part. This tends to happen in my talks. Um, but think about this sort of thing. When you're, if you end up converting a mutable type to an immutable type, make sure that all the method names, anything that sounds like it's doing a mutation, is changed to something that sounds like it's returning a mutated version, as it were. So, this is kind of nicer. I don't have the dot builder all over the place. Um, I quite like this. And in fact, this sort of thing is the way that we're probably going to end up doing the settings class that I was talking about before. Um, there is one downside, which is if I need to call five different withers, so suppose I had lots more properties than name, address, phones. Suppose I had age, gender, um, you know, preference in trousers, whatever it is. Um, awesome, in this case. Um, <laughs> I would end up creating a new object every time. So as your number of uh, properties increases, so you have n properties, and if you want to specify them all with withers instead of with um, a single constructor call, you end up with an n squared set of uh, an n squared uh, memory allocation because you're allocating, you're copying those n properties n times. Now, obviously, it doesn't. You know, if you're using strings, then all you're copying is the reference, um, but it's still it's not good. Enter C sharp seven. No, enter C sharp eight, <laughs> maybe. So back when I originally wrote this, C sharp seven, there wasn't even a preview, uh, but there were sort of discussions about record types. And we were hoping that record types would be in C sharp seven. I'm now 99% sure that record types will not be in C sharp seven, um, not because the team doesn't want them, but because they're a responsible team. Uh, I have huge, huge respect for the C-sharp team. And record types are really difficult to design. Let me show you, I won't show you all the problems, but let me show you what a record type might look like. You'll have to ignore the red squigglies. Um, so one thing I really like about this, has anyone noticed something different about this example than all the others, other than the red squiggles? It's sufficiently short, in fact, that this is the whole example. This isn't just person, or just address, or just phone number. This is all of them, apart from the um, phone number type, which I haven't even declared in this project. I need to copy that at some point. Um, it's awesome. The problem is what happens with uh, Versioning, so how do I, if I later want to add style of trousers to person, um, how can I do that without breaking existing code? Um, and additionally, uh, what happens, can I derive from person? Can I add extra properties to person, sorry, add extra methods to person to do business logic, etc.? There are various questions, um, none of which have entirely satisfactory answers yet. Or rather, there are many different satisfactory answers, but no one set of answers that is satisfactory for all the questions. You can satisfy some of the questions with one set of answers and a different set of questions with a different set of answers. So the team's going to have another think about it and see whether we can get it in C Sharp 8. Um, it would be great if we could. And the withers problem goes away because with becomes a first class concept. So here I have with just a single address. And aside from anything else, you know, it, it is John with. So you can't just call with, uh, you can't call the wither without 
knowing that you're doing it to another object. Um, and you can't, I don't think it would be valid as a statement in its own right. So that, because it's clearly useless, I don't believe would be any more um, valid than new person with stuff. You know, that's not a valid statement in C Sharp. Um, and I don't think the with would be either. But the great thing is you can do with that and with name equals foo. So that's as if you were calling two with methods, but actually the C-sharp compiler will just generate a constructor call copying all the other properties and allowing you to specify as many things as you want in one go. So you can sort of mix and match when you do bits of initialization. So there's a lot of possibilities there. We'll see whether things actually ship. Um, hopefully less than five years, but we can dream. Um, I'm not going to talk about the memory model in the end, other than to say, uh, does everyone have a vague idea of what a memory model is? OK. Um, your code isn't as safe as you think it is, basically. Uh, if one thread, in a nice world, suppose we have a mutable data type in here, and I'm one thread, and I write a value, and Mada is another thread, and she reads the value, wouldn't it be nice if, if I'd written it before Mada read it, she read the new value? Sounds like that's a sensible thing to expect. Sometimes it'll happen. Sometimes it won't. Um, the memory model is kind of vague. If you use locks appropriately, then the right things will happen. Uh, but there's, there is crazy, crazy stuff that isn't guaranteed to be safe. Um, I wish I had enough time to go into it. Uh, very quickly, some thoughts about why this is a problem to start with. Why don't we have immutability wired into our brains and wired into our language? Well, for one thing, sometimes it is just easier. It's easier and more efficient to modify an array in place several times um, than to try to keep creating a new collection every time you want to make a modification to one aspect of it. Um, the language has encouraged us from the start to think about mutable things. Uh, object-oriented languages almost always do. So F sharp being more functional than object-oriented encourages immutability everywhere and allows you to have little pockets of local mutability. Um, and not only the language, but the framework you know, we only have immutable list of T as an add-on, and uh, that took several years. You know, where was that in 1.0? Nowhere to be found. More worryingly, our type system, just to highlight the bit that I'm talking about, um, the type system isn't designed to think about this. The type system allows it expresses what you can do rather than what you can't do. So it doesn't help that I read only list is an interface that says you can read it. It's really I readable list. It only exposes the read things, but it doesn't say that's all that can be. You can't have an interface and say, if you implement this interface, you can't also do something else. It's additive rather than subtractive. Whereas with immutability, what we're trying to say is, we only want you to be able to do a particular set of operations. All the slides are on GitHub, apart from the changes that I made this morning that I haven't pushed yet. So there is more stuff that I haven't covered, but just for once, I'm going to be responsible and finished nearly on time. Um, there's huge amounts that you can talk about immutability. Please think about using immutable types. Think about how you can make them nice to use, because if you make them a pain to use, no one will use them. And uh, have a lovely time in C Sharp, and have a fantastic rest of LeetSpeak. Thank you.